So what are the chances of getting on in life? Do they depend on who your mum and dad are, where you live, where you come from, or how much hard work and talent that you have? If you're interested in that question, then you're going to be interested in the topic of social mobility. And what we mean by social mobility is your chances of, of climbing the social ladder, the chances of doing well in life. And over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you and introduce you to this amazing topic uh, that I'm a, a passionate uh, expert in. And I, I want to start with this uh, first slide, which is a very stark image of a very unequal playing field. And, and the reason I've, I've done that is that the debates about social mobility really are about this, this notion of a playing field. How fair is society? And it's my view that we actually live in a very unequal society. And that's shown by this uh, un unlevel playing field. Of course, it would be probably an empty stadium, wouldn't, wouldn't it, in, in, the, in the pandemic era? Um, but my view is that we were so unequal that those people at the bottom of the social ladder are straggle, struggling to, to climb up, up the ladder. And the central question beneath this debate, I think, is to what extent we allow freedom for parents to invest in their children's futures against this other competing need in society to do the best for those from, from all backgrounds, particularly those from, from poorer backgrounds. So I want you to think about that question as, as I go through the slides. I am Lee Elliott Major. I'm the first professor of social mobility in the country. And I'm a professor of practice here at the University of Exeter. And what that means is I do lots of research, uh, teaching of, of students and, and trainee teachers, but I'm also interested in impact on the real world. So I work with governments, I work with teachers, I work with young people uh, to try and improve the prospects of social mobility uh, in society. And I am myself uh, a product, if you like, of social mobility. I'm the first person in my family to go to university uh, and I lived on my own when I was 15 and, and left school, went back to school. So this is very much a personal passion as well as a, a professional uh, passion. So I want to cover three main topics today um, and, and the first really is around the fact that we, we think the research shows, and I hope I'm not going to be too depressing here today, uh, that social mobility has declined in this country. So the chances of doing well in, in life have declined for the current generation. I'm also going to talk about this link between inequality and social mobility. So a lot of the public debates about this talk about both the gaps between people from richer and poorer backgrounds, but also uh, the chances of, of climbing the social ladder. And then I'm going to talk about education. Education, we hope, is going to be this great social leveller that levels up opportunities. But I'm going to explain why education systems struggle to do that. So those are the three things I'm going to talk about. So the social mobility decline. So what we know is that every generation since the World War II, since the war, have done better than the previous one. So if you measure, for example, average earnings for each generation, each generation since the war, in real terms, that's so that it, it, taking in consideration uh, the costs of inflation, um, did better than their parents' generation apart from one generation, and that's the generation growing up now. It's probably you listening to this now. And what we know is, on average, uh, the earnings of young people today are less than their parents were a, a generation before. And, and that's an important fact, because I think that is why we have all these debates about fairness and, and a lack of opportunity in society. And it's why we, we need to address these issues. This is uh, one slide that just shows the the post-war trends uh, over, over the last sort of 80 years. And, and I won't go into each uh, era in detail because I don't have time, but, but, but really uh, the point here is that there was this golden age of social mobility after, after, immediately after the war, and that was because the economy and society was expanding and new jobs were emerging. The sociologists would say there's more room at the top, there was more jobs being created. And, and as I said, we're now in this era, since the, the big recession in 2008, 
of declining opportunity. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get on in life. It just means that, for, for example, getting a house as a young person, getting on the, the social, social ladder or the housing ladder is more difficult. But, but it still means that you can, you can, you can get on, on, on in life. And this was really before the pandemic. And I'm going to talk a bit about what's happened uh, later, about what's happened during, during the pandemic. And this is a graph just showing what I was what, what talked about earlier, this decline in average earnings. So what we see is, uh, so this is the proportion of, of young people growing up who are earning more than or equal to their parents. And what you see after 2007, that slowly, uh, that was, it's a sharp decline in, in, in the proportion of children growing up as adults who are, who are earning as much as, as their parents. I suspect that will decline further uh, after the, the pandemic. So the second main finding from the social mobility research that I've been involved with and, and others is this link between uh, inequality and immobility. Immobility is the lack of, of, of social mobility. And, and, and what we know is, and, and the following slide really sums it up neatly for me, and this is a bunch of uh, developed nations that we've got data for. And what we're doing here is we're measuring how unequal they are. So the further to the right of that graph, the more unequal the nations are. So the bigger the gaps between rich and poor. And the further, the higher up on that graph, uh, the less mobile those nations are. Okay. And, and what you find is, if you look, Great Britain and the United States, the United States, the, the land of the American dream, supposedly, uh, we are the most unequal nations, but also the least mobile. And, and, and there's lots of debate about this because this is a correlation, okay? This is not proving there is a, a cause between unequal, uh, unequal outcomes in society and, and, and less mobility. It, it's, it's showing that, that these two things are somehow linked. Uh, but I would argue that there are compelling reasons why if you have uh, stark inequalities, particularly in early life, that leads to, to um, wider outcomes I I in later life. So I think the, you know, any politician who's serious about social mobility, in my view, needs to be thinking about redistribution and, and inequality. I still think you need to think about social mobility as well, because you know, who is at the top of society is important for all of us. So a lot of my work is about campaigning to have more diversity at the very top of our society, whether it's politicians or lawyers or wh whatever industry we're, we're talking about. And it's really important that I think we have people at the top of society that are, are serving uh, the, the wider population, that are representative of, of the wider uh, population. So, so we know that these two things are linked, inequality and, and, and social mobility. So education, uh, the great social level. So there's a, there's a, a lovely graph that I, I use for my lecture, and this is it. This is about 100 years old, this, um, this picture. And it, it's an advert, it's an American college. And it, ha and it really, I love it because it really conceptualizes this idea of, of, of education being the sort of great escalator. So this is a, a sort of sliding doors moment. I don't know if you remember that film, Sliding Doors, where you, you know, make one choice and that really affects what happens uh, in, your, in your future life. And, and the advert is cleverly sort of showing this young man who, if he goes to college, he, he ends up being happier and earns more. Uh, and if he doesn't, then he, he increasingly sort of feels sad and increasingly morose. I always feel sorry for that last picture there at the end. Um, now, of course, education and going to university and school is important. It can be transformative. But what we find is, is, is that, that the education system isn't the great social leveller uh, that we, we would all wish for. And the reason for this is that those uh, families who do have the resources, the middle classes, to invest in their children are doing so ever more. And over the last few decades, we've, we've documented this. And this is one graph that just shows the extent of private tutoring outside school. And this has boomed over the last uh, two decades. Uh, and, and, you know, in places like London, I think it's like 40% now of 11 to 16 year olds have some form of private tutoring outside schools. Um, and the reason this is interesting from a social mobility perspective is that if you happen to be from a family that don't have, doesn't have those resources, then you're going to be left behind uh, in this, what we call the education arms race. So even though schools and universities are doing a lot to try and counter the inequalities outside, um, they're, they're up against this, what, what, what I call the education arms race. 
And the research I've been involved in uh, during the pandemic over the last year and a half has shown that inequalities in education have uh, exacerbated, been exacerbated and exposed by that uh, crisis. And this slide just shows uh, the differences in likelihood of, of, of benefiting from a full school day during all those school closures that have happened uh, du du during the, the pandemic. And what we found was that those from private schools were twice as likely to have benefited from a full school day compared to their state school uh, counterparts. So these are uh, really profound uh, uh, losses du during the, the pandemic. And this graph just shows you uh, where we are in terms of uh, what we call the achievement gap. So every year, uh, myself and colleagues document uh, the gap between uh, pupils from poorer backgrounds and the rest of pupils in schools what GCSEs are they getting and what is the gap between that? Now, there's always been a gap uh, between, between uh, people from poor, pupils from poor backgrounds and their, their richer counterparts. But what we're seeing here, so this is the extent of the gap. You see over the, over the uh, last decade, that gap was starting to come down. But over the last year, we've seen that gap re reverse. We've seen all those gains over the last decade. I told you I was gonna de depress you, uh, uh, that, that, that they have been reversed. So we are really facing huge challenges um, in, in the post-pandemic world. And I and others have been involved in championing ex for extra investment in education and talking to the government about what they should do in terms of the recovery uh, post-pandemic. The other thing that's happening in education, and I think this is happening in schools and universities, is they are shouldering, in my view, uh, wider and wider responsibilities. So I, when I visit schools and universities, uh, what you're what finding is that they're effectively acting like social welfare institutions as much as centres for learning. And I think this is one of the big debates that I'm interested in, uh, and, and I'm, I'm always talking to young people about um, their experiences here as well. I think we need a national debate about what is the role of, uh, of education and how far uh, is, is responsibility for teachers to look after children in, in all sorts of other ways, as well as teaching them in, in the classroom. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was quickly was variations in social mobility. And I wanted to just to mention a couple of other uh, important findings that my, my work has, has produced. And, and this is really what, I, what we call the bottom end of social what, what happens to children who come out of school without basic uh, maths or uh, English, uh, who, who have essentially failed their GCSEs. And what we find is, I call it lost souls, because I, I feel like this, the education system is failing uh, these young people. And what we find is, it always surprises people, about 25% of pupils leave school without basic maths and, and, and literacy, which I think is a national scandal. When you look at the international comparisons, again, it's only, it's only the US that do worse than us on this. So I think that's a big challenge and something that we, we need to address if we're gonna address uh, issues of, of, of national uh, social mobility. At the other end of the spectrum, at the very top, and I sort of mentioned this uh, earlier, we see that those from private schools dominate uh, those people in, in high positions in society. Private schools make up about 7% of all schools, but what we find is about 50% of leaders in politics, the media and other industries are from those schools. And a lot of my work is really saying, well, look, we're missing out basically on a lot of that 93% of state school students uh, who, who should, if they want to go into those industries, um, consider that, that sort of career. You know, my, my definition of social media in many ways has changed over the years. And what I would say is it's about um, the fact that background shouldn't determine what you want to do in your life, right? Now, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you want to be a, a, a top lawyer or, or, or stay in, in your locality and, and be a teacher or whatever it is. But your background shouldn't determine that. It should be down to your hard work and, and effort. So another project um, I'm involved in is looking at the Southwest in particular, because what we're realizing in this research now is so we've, we've done a lot of international comparisons, which I showed you earlier, looking at the social mobility levels of different countries. But what we're also finding is that social mobility varies by place, by, by town, by county, uh, by region in, in the UK. So one of the research projects I'm doing at the moment is looking at what are the particular challenges of social mobility in the southwest of the country. And we're producing a regional uh, sort of report uh, to, to look at those issues. And what we're finding 
uh, apart from everything else, is that the Southwest suffers from a particular issue around disconnectivity. Uh, so we need better connectivity, whether it's the roads in Devon or whether it's actually internet access for, for, for young people that live across a big region that has lots of rural and coastal areas. So I'm talking to government about this and I'm arguing that we actually need a regional strategy uh, for every uh, part of our country to address social mobility if we're, if we're serious about it. A lot of government is, is talking about levelling up at the moment, which I think is a, is a similar sort of idea. How do we enable people, wherever they live, to have opportunities in life? So finally, as I said, you know, I'm a professor of practice, so I'm interested in research and teaching, but I'm also interested in how do we actually improve prospects for uh, young people, particularly in, in, in our country uh, and indeed elsewhere. So I'm, I'm constantly engaged with government on this. And, and, and I just thought I'd, I'd sort of uh, explain a few of the things that, that I, I'm uh, involved in. Uh, you know, I'm helping the university, by the way, in terms of its own access uh, efforts, in terms of uh, recruiting students from all backgrounds. And, 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 I, th and, and I think we're becoming a far more welcome, uh, welcoming institution in, term, in terms of, of, of young people from all backgrounds. But in terms of national debates, um, what I've been looking at um, is actually the other half of, of young people that don't go to university. And there's lots of debates about this, and I think we need more support uh, and government grants for those those young people who do apprenticeships, who go, who go straight into work. So that's one of the big debates about social mobility, the other half. What happens to the half of young people that go, they go, don't go to university? There's big issues about the workplace, and, 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 and many of you will uh, have recognised this. I think there's a real issue around uh, basic conditions that, that everyone should have. Um, we, we had a big debate in this country 20 years ago about a minimum, having a minimum wage, and, and I'm glad that, that we now do have a, a min, minimum uh, salary, but I think we now need a debate about minimum conditions. So that means what are the basic entitlements, entitlements that all people should have, irrespective of what, of what job they do. So I'm very much involved in that, and I think all jobs should have some progression in them. So what, what, when you start a job, what, are, what is the progression within that company or, or workplace that you, you are in? Um, and then finally, another thing that I'm involved in is I talk to lots of big employers about their own diversity efforts. So most of the major employers now in this country will have what they call diversity and inclusion strategies. And the thing that I'm pushing them on at the moment is that they are uh, focusing on gender and ethnicity and other characteristics, which I think are all really important. But the one thing that they're missing out on at the moment is social class, is, is, is actually how to uh, attract and develop people, particularly those from sort of working class backgrounds. So social class alongside these other characteristics, I think, is a really important uh, thing. So in summing up, um, you know, I, I've tried to give you some main facts uh, of social mobility research and, and outline some of, of the challenges. I just want to end on a more positive note because there, there is a tendency, and I said earlier I didn't want to depress you, but I, I think there is a chance now um, in, in a post-pandemic era to actually address some of these profound issues. I really do think, I really believe we're at a moment in history where if, if we group together and we think radically, we can change some of these profound inequalities that have been affecting society for, for so long. And I'm involved with government and others in, in, in trying to do that. I actually think a lot of this comes down to the young people that are growing up now, many of whom are students. And I, and I really uh, would, would I engage with students a lot and I, and I encourage them to challenge governments and actually some of the sort of uh, assumptions about society that we have. Um, so, so I think we are at a moment where we can change uh, uh, the, these issues. I just quote uh, uh, Roosevelt there from, from the, the American sort of deep depression because America really recovered amazingly well um, uh, during that era. Um, and then finally, um, there are many books I've written about this uh, that, that please do go and get um, available in all good bookstores. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in Exeter sometime soon. <laughs>